spirit of Christmas, please sing along. Test, test. is from far as far as the curse is from. I'm going to bring it up now. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders and wonders of his love and wonders and wonders of his love wow you sound great you sound great good morning please be seated Turn around and uh, give somebody a high five this morning. Why not? <laughs> All right. You can take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. I love, I'm dreaming of a green and warm Christmas. I don't know about you, but that's all right for me. And uh, boo, yeah, boo. Uh, last week we talked about uh, Christmas and that this uh, is indeed the most wonderful time of the year. But for us, it's the most wonderful time of the year because of Jesus Christ and because it's a time for us to be able to focus on him and to uh, praise our God for his faithfulness and to celebrate uh, his plan and his promise. And last week we talked about having a Merry Christmas rather than a Martha Christmas. And those of you familiar with that story or who were here last week, we were reminded that it's so easy to get caught up in the preparation of this time of year and forget what the most important thing is. And that's about drawing close to our Lord and being mindful of his words like Mary did while Martha was in the kitchen. And so we talked about how we could have a Christmas time where we could glorify God and draw closer to Him. So this morning we're going to talk a little bit about why should we celebrate the birth of Christ. Some, some people will say, well, we should celebrate the birth of Christ because that's what we've always done. And sometimes that's a good reason, right? I go to Chipotle every Sunday night, and I'm going to until I get E. coli. That's just what we do. Another reason why we might celebrate the birth of Christ is because that's what everyone else is doing. 
right? You ever see like a, a bunch of people lined up outside a store? You know, you're driving by and you see everybody, like there's a line outside the front of the store. What do you do? You stop what you're doing, you park, and you get in line. It doesn't matter what they're waiting for, but it's just like, apparently something's going to happen here and I want to be there, right? It's something free maybe or, you know, uh, TVs are $100 and we, we just have to go there, right? And some of us aren't like that, but some of us just do it because that's what everyone else does. And for some of us, we think we should celebrate because it's fun. It's festive. It's fa la 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 eight las, right? It's not just a time of fa la la, but it's a time of fa la 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 la. And so that's the reason to do it. It's just it's fun, it's festive, and and a joyful time. But you know, for some people, Christmas is not a joyful time of the year. For for many people, it's a sad time. Even even for Christians, and it can be difficult. We, um, you know, we, we think about how we miss uh, loved ones that may have passed, and um, we remember that people aren't at the table who we uh, used to have there, and, and we shy away because of maybe your painful memories from our childhood when things didn't go right, right? For some of us, it's, a, it's, it's not a joyful time of year because it's very stressful, and uh, we have unfulfilled expectations and anxiety and things like that, and and for some people, uh, and these people are Christians, for some, the traditions that are associated with Chris Christmas, um, some of them are very strange in their origin or their history, right? We, it's very common that we know Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. That's the time we celebrate it, though. And uh, what's the deal with cutting down a tree and putting it to your house and lighting it up and giving presents and things like that? What's the deal with all that? And, and some people have spent a lot of time investigating the origins of these things and uh, I used to be one of those people, and I was very obsessed with the fact that uh, some of these practices are very strange, and you could, you could see a comparison with pagan things that people in the ancient world did, and December 25th is, is not really Jesus' birthday, it's Hitler's birthday, and we can't, it's not really, but we, we like make these weird connections, and, and so um, we get stressed out and lack joy because we are afraid of Christmas because we might be worshiping the devil. I, feel, I used to feel that way. So I can laugh at it now because I've been delivered. Praise God. But one of the things that, uh, and, and some of this is true. There, there are strange origins and look at it. But if it steals your peace and if you come out of this whole process lacking joy, it can't be good. You know, I used to be someone like this. And I remember uh, I had a coworker. Uh, who was sort of Christian, and I was the most Christian person that this person knew. And they came to me one year, and they said, are you getting excited for Christmas? And I was like, why would I celebrate Christmas? I'm not going to put a pagan symbol in my, my living room. And she goes, oh, okay. And it was such a strange thing that for the rest of the year, when I'm focused on Christ, the time that the rest of the world is actually thinking about God and Jesus Christ... I'm adamantly opposed to it and judging anyone else that is. And I realized I didn't think that was the right fruit of those things, right? And you want to look at the fruit. If those things aren't leading us to glorify God more, then there might be an issue there. So why do we celebrate Christmas? And in, in Luke chapter 1, we're going to look at some of the reasons this morning why do it. In Luke chapter 1, verse 26, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. And a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was who? Mary. And coming in, he said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. Anytime somebody comes into your house and just randomly says, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you, you kind of go, Oh, yeah. Right? And, and Mary is taken back. It's, an, it's an angel who's doing this, named Gabriel. Do not be afraid, the angel said. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him what? And listen to what the angel says. And this is what we're going to focus on this morning. You shall name him Jesus, and he will be great. And he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. For many people, the time of Christmas is a time when we celebrate 
Jesus' birth. But what I hope to look at this morning is that we are celebrating so much, something so much bigger than just a man that was born. Because in fact, the angel's very first words to Mary, Jesus' mother, is that his name shall be Jesus, he will be great, and he will rule on the throne of his father David forever. And God himself will be this child's father. That is amazing. I want to look at this this morning. Go to 1 Chronicles, please, in the Old Testament. And if you don't have a Bible with you this morning, if you want to scoot next to someone that looks friendly enough to share... 1 Chronicles is in the Old Testament after 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings. You've got 1 and 2 Chronicles. And we're going to go to 1 Chronicles chapter 17. 1 Chronicles chapter 17. Do you hear what I hear? A child, a child. That's great. So we're in 1 Chronicles chapter 17, and, and I want to take us back here because in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth, amen? He spoke in, with a word, and, and the heavens and earth came to be, and he, his plan was to have a place that was very, very good for man to dwell and to be in relation with him. And the first man was named Adam, and his wife was named Eve, and they lived in paradise. They lived in a garden called Eden, and everything was right. Everything was great. There was no evil. There was no sin. But then as we know and as we've seen the ramifications in our own lives and in the world around us, they did sin. And this is something that the scriptures called the fall of man. When mankind turned from God, their creator, and instead chose to do things their way. And, and God, since that very moment when they fell, has been working in this amazing divine plan to bring about what he originally intended in the beginning. And so God finds, he's looking for a man that won't rebel from him, but someone that will be faithful to him. And he finds... Someone like that in a man named Abraham. Can you say Abraham? Abraham? Abraham. Not Abraham Lincoln. He was good. But then the man Abraham Lincoln was named after was a man named Abraham. And God called Abraham from a land of idolatry and said, Abraham, I'm going to start things over with you and your people and your children. And the people of Abraham became what we know as the nation of Israel. And the children of Israel grew. And there were many, many descendants of this man Abraham. And God's desire was to start this new creation through his people named Israel, where he would be their God and they would be his people, just like it was in the garden. It wasn't like this all over the world yet, but he was going to start it through the people of Abraham, the people of Israel. And some days the people of Israel did what God wanted, and some days the people of Israel did what they wanted. And it really was a roller coaster. If you ever read the book of Judges, on one page it's like, and then they all worship the Lord, and then on the next page, and then they all turn from the Lord. And the next page... They all worship the Lord, right? It seems like some of our lives are like that sometimes, doesn't it? But that's what the people of Israel were like. And finally, they got into a special place that God had prepared for them. And he, he's starting to work his plan out. And he gives them a king that will rule over them. And the first king didn't do so well. But the second king was a man named David. Can you say David? David. And the thing that made David so special is he started out as a nobody. He was a shepherd. A shepherd boy that actually when the prophet came to pick the new king, he wasn't even invited to the party. He was out in the fields, and when the prophet came and said, do you have any more children? His father was named Jesse. He said, well, yeah, I got one more, David, but you don't want to see him. He's out with the sheep. <laughs> Isn't that amazing, right? But David ended up becoming the king, and the reason that he was so special was because he had a great heart for God. He just loved God. And in David, God was finding what he originally intended in the beginning, someone that cared about what he cared about more than himself. And David was so zealous to please God. He really loved God so much. He wrote most of the book of Psalms. If you've ever heard of the Psalms, Psalm 23, the most famous Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. David wrote that. David wrote that. He wrote most of the Psalms. And there's this great moment in history where David is now the king, and he really wants to please God. He really wants to honor God. He wants to make God a, a temple, a house where God's presence will dwell. And there's this great moment here we're going to read about in verse 7 of 1 Chronicles 17. And this is what God says to David. God says, Now therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture and from following the sheep. Not leading the sheep. Isn't that great? He was following the sheep. He wasn't a very good shepherd, I guess, maybe. <laughs> I took you from the pasture from following the sheep to be the what? To be the leader over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone. And I have 
cut off all your enemies before you, and I will make you a name like the name of the great ones who are in the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and not be moved again. And the wicked will not waste them anymore as formerly, even from the day that I commanded the judges to be over my people Israel. And I will subdue all of your enemies. Listen to this. Moreover, I tell you that the Lord will build a house for you. When your days are fulfilled that you must go to be with your fathers, that I will set up one of your descendants after you, who will be of your sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for me, and I will establish his throne how long? So God loved David so much that he made him a promise. He said, you know, David, you're such a great king. You have such a great heart for me, and I'm going to extend my blessing to you. My desire to get back to what I originally in the, intended in the beginning, to have a, a, a people on the earth that God could love and that could love God, I'm going to work this out through you. And David, one of your descendants is going to be the king of this world for how long? Forever. And something special about this one who is going to be this son of David, it says in verse 13, I will be his father and he shall be my son. And I will not take my loving kindness away from him as I took it from him who was before you, but I will settle him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. He says forever a bunch of times there, doesn't he? I think God's trying to get a point home that this is going to be how long? Forever. It's going to be a forever kind of kingdom. So this promise here is what we call the Davidic covenant. And the basic elements of the Davidic covenant is that there was going to be a king who was going to be the son of David and the son of God, who would rule forever. Son of David, son of God, rule forever. Let me hear you say that. Son of David, son of God, rule forever. Son of David? Go ahead. Son of God? We never do that right. I always say, okay, ready? Let's try it again. I'm going to say it, you repeat after me. You ready? You ready, Tom? Don't mess this up, Tom. Son of David. We still didn't get it. <laughs> That's good. Son of, David, Son of David. Son of God. Son of God. King forever. King forever. Beautiful. Beautiful. Go to Psalm 89. This promise that there would be a king like David became the hope of the people of God. Because David eventually died, and his son ruled in his place, and then he died, and then his son ruled in his place, and then he died, and his son ruled in his place, but there was this seed planted in the heart of the people of God that one day there would be a descendant of David who actually would also be the son of God and that he would rule not just for 40 years or 50 years or 20 years, but rule forever and that God would be with him. It says in Psalm 89, this is a great psalm of praise, it says in verse 1, I will sing of the loving kindness of the Lord forever. To all generations I will make known your faithfulness with my mouth. For I have said, loving kindness will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. I have made a covenant to my chosen. I have sworn to David my servant that I will establish your seed forever and build up your throne to all generations. Look at verse 19. Once you spoke in visions to your godly ones and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found David my servant and my holy oil I have anointed him. With my holy oil I have anointed him. With whom my hand will be established. My arm also will strengthen him. The enemy will not deceive him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. So now the psalmist is talking about this one son of David that will come. Verse 23, but I shall crush his adversaries before him and strike those who hate him. My faithfulness and my loving kindness will be with him, and my, in my name his horn will be exalted. I shall also set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers, and he will cry to me, You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I also shall make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My loving kindness I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall be confirmed to him. So will I establish his descendants forever and his throne as the days of heavens. If his sons forsake my law and they do not walk in my judgments, if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgressions with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. But I will not break off my loving kindness from him, 
nor do you falsely in my faithfulness. My covenant I will not violate, nor will I alter the utterance of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His descendants shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon and the witness is in the sky is faithful. Salah. So this, this song was written because the people were so excited that God was going to be faithful to David, their king, right? When you have a good king, you want him to be around forever, right? Like when we have a good president, if that ever happened, if we had a good president, <laughs> just imagine with me, if we ever had a president that was good and right and just and, and never made mistakes and, and encouraged people to do the right thing, and imagine if we had a president that even encourage people to worship God and to praise Him, and right? And instead of a Department of Homeland Security, there was a Department of Homegrown Praise, right? Where He established authority figures to have people uh, praising God all day, that there would be a praise night every night. Wouldn't that be fantastic, right? That's what it was like when David was king. And so that sort of served as the model for what people always wanted. It was the good old days, Right? And what they wanted, and they kept waiting for a new king like David to come. And they even wrote songs about it like this. Go to Isaiah, please, chapter 9. So you had to imagine that after each uh, king came, they probably had a hope, like, is this the one? Right? Is this the one? Anytime there's a new president inaugurated, for the most part, well, at least half the country is hopeful, right? And we go, well, maybe things are going to get a little better now. Right? And so many political candidates, their, their promotion is that you know, we, can, we can change the way things are going and we can make it better, right? Or if we've had a good administration, their vice president may come and like, I'm going to keep these policies going, right? And, and so when David was king and when he died, I'm sure there was so much hope that it would continue through his son. And then when he turned and a new king came, maybe there were a few people that were like, maybe it was going to be like when David was king again. And eventually and sadly, that never happened. The kings didn't continue to be faithful. Some were good, but a lot of them were bad. And so what God did is what he, he called people called prophets. And what prophets were were people that God would give a special message to and would come to his people and sort of preach a message to either get their attention, to call them to repent or to comfort them. And a lot of the message of these prophets, people like Isaiah and Jeremiah, names you may have heard before, a lot of their message was that just hold on because the son of David is going to come. And when he does, he's going to make everything right. There's this great section here in Isaiah chapter 9. We've heard this. We usually read this around Christmas time. In verse 2, it says, the people, who walk in great, who, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence as with the gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. Verse 6. Here's why they'd be glad. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. Here would be his, his name, his throne name, like the title that he would have. He would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace, and on the throne of who? the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So here's one of the prophets. It's like, look, I know things are bad, but you just, you just hold on. Because though it seems dark, a great light's going to come and a child will be born and he's going to be a great king. The end of his government will never happen, and he will increase peace. There won't be just a little season, and then it, war strikes again, but the increase of his government will never end, right? He won't just be the prince. He'll be the prince of peace, and it'll be great. It'll be great. And so the prophets would come and remind the people that this is what they are hoping for. This is what they were waiting for. They were waiting for the son of David, who would be the son of God, who would be the king how long? Forever. Forever. Look at Isaiah chapter 11, please. So this was the hope that they had in their soul, waiting and waiting for it to happen. In Isaiah 11, it's an interesting picture here. It says that a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. Jesse was David's father. So a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots 
will bear fruit. Talking about someone that would come from the line of Jesse is going to come. And here's a description about what this king would be like. It says that the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make decisions by what his ears hear. Wouldn't we uh, enjoy a ruler like that? who delighted in the fear of the Lord, who judged not by what he saw or heard, but verse 4, with righteousness he would judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also righteousness will be the belt about his loins and faithfulness the belt about his waist. And a result of this king coming, it says that the wolf will dwell with the lamb. Does that usually happen? No. And the leopard will lie down with the young goat and a calf and a young lion and a fatling together, and a little boy will lead them. Also a cow and a bear will graze. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. We know that lions don't eat straw like the ox, do they? They need like 16 pounds of meat a day. Don't you remember that? Not straw. And a nursing child will play by the hole of a cobra. And a wean child will put his hand on the viper's den. That's not what parents usually do. And they will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as waters cover the sea. And in that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for all people, and his resting place will be what? Glorious. It'll be glorious. So here we hear that this, this root, this stem, from the trunk of Jesse's tree is going to come, and as a result of this one who's going to come, the whole earth will be transformed. It won't be just a limited, like over here things will be good. The whole earth will be transformed, so much so that the wolf and the sheep will be friends, and the lion and the cow are going to be hanging out together, going to the hay buffet, okay? <laughs> That just speaks how radical his transformation of this administration will be. It's an interesting language here. We have it that a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse and that the nations will resort to the root of Jesse. And this isn't something that we often are thinking about, is it? Roots and stems. This is the best I could get for a trunk, okay? Uh, this is, imagine this is a trunk of a tree. This is just a log, but... Just oblige me for a little while. See that? See that? How many of us have ever cut down our own Christmas tree? Raise your hand if you've ever cut down your own Christmas tree or gone to the place where you can cut your own, but you let them do it for you with that powerful chainsaw like I did, right? You know what I mean? You go to the, get a Christmas tree, you cut it down, right? Where do you cut it? Cut it right at the bottom, right? And then you trim a few of the branches at the bottom so you can stick it in your tree stand, right? And, and what's left when you leave the Christmas tree farm with you have your tree? What's left as a remnant there? Just a stump, right? A stump and then the roots that go in it, right? And Christmas trees uh, are only good for one season, right? And for many of us, by the end of that season, it's not even good, right? We forget to water it, right? Someone said we should put Coca-Cola in it and that didn't work out or something like that. And, and so uh, the tree only lasts one season. If you go to the place that you cut your tree down, right? I cut a tree down last, well, I had the guy cut the tree down last, last Sunday. If I went back to that exact spot, would I see any new life coming from it? No, because that's not what happens when you cut a tree down. And when all that's left is a stump, new life doesn't spring from that stump. And in fact, in many cases, in order to not damage the rest of the tree farm, you have to, you, some farmers actually have to remove the stump. Remove the stump. And, and here's one of the reasons why. Has anyone ever heard of anisus root rot? Really? <laughs> of course we haven't. Anisus root rot, and you can read the Latin on your own, is introduced into a previously uninfected stand by airborne spores. When spores land on fresh cut stumps, they germinate and the fungus grows through the root system of the infected stump. And then infected roots of living trees adjacent to the 
infected stumps through root graft. As it invades the host, the fungus decreases the capacity of the root system to supply water and nutrients. The fungus also compromises the structural integrity of the root system so that it cannot support the tree as well. And I'll explain what that means. When you cut the tree down, you go to the Christmas tree farm, you cut it down, all that's left in the, as the stump, spores from other living trees and molds and things like that can land on these, on these stumps. And what happens is these mold spores infest the, the trunk of the, the stump of the tree that's remaining, and it goes into the root system. And it contaminates the rest of the roots of that tree. Now, that doesn't matter anymore because the tree's gone. However, these infected roots that are hanging down over here may touch the roots of healthy trees over here. And if they do, it will infect the healthy tree so that the tree cannot live anymore. So what do you want to do to a stump after you've cut down the Christmas tree? You want to get rid of it, right? You want to dig it out. Maybe you grind it, but a lot of times they remove it all together, right? Has anyone ever pulled a stump out of, a, out of the ground? That's one of the hardest things you could ever do, right? It's tough, right? Here's what, here's what they say you can do here. Once infected, stump treatments are not effective in preventing the spread of the fungus into the stump roots and therefore into the roots of adjacent healthy trees that are in contact with the colonized roots. In addition, seedlings can also become infected when their roots come into contact with the disease root and stump left over from the previous crop. And this is a whole paper that this, uh, this doctor, this professional wrote about advocating stump removal from Christmas tree farms to save the crop for next year. When you have a tree cut down, New life doesn't grow from it. And in fact, to preserve everything else, you should get rid of it altogether. You should get rid of it altogether. What we're being told here is that at the very time when it looked like the kingdom of David would be no more, that, that Jesse's tree is cut down totally. And it looks like maybe we should just get rid of this hope and this expectation altogether that life could come from this tree and that the kingdom of David could continue. There's a stump left in the ground. It says that a shoot starts to spring forth. And this little shoot that starts to spring forth from the stump of Jesse is this great hope and expectation of the son of David, who will also be the son of God, who will rule forever. It's Jesus. So it looked like it was dead. It looked like it was over. And the stump's sitting there. There's no use for it anymore. Let's get rid of it. But the prophet says, hold on a second. You see what I see? Something springs up. New life springs up from where it seemed to be cut off. And so this hope for this, this stem, this root from Jesse's tree to grow was the hope of the people of God. It says in Jeremiah 23 that, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous what? A righteous branch. We're moving past the seedling phase now, so there's going to be a branch from David's tree. And he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he shall be called, the Lord, our righteousness. It says in Jeremiah 33 that the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I fulfill the good word which I've spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days... And at that time, I will cause a righteous branch of David to spring forth, and he shall execute justice and righteousness on the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And in this is the name by which he will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. It might have seemed like that's what was supposed to happen, but God had bigger plans even when it seemed like all hope was lost. When it seemed like we should take the tree out of the ground, new life starts to spring forth. And the people that had been watching and waiting go, there he is. There he is. In Ezekiel, did I already do this? Jeremiah? Yeah, this is the rest of Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant for day and my covenant for night, so that day and night will not be appointed 
be at their appointed time, then my covenant may also be broken with David my servant, so that he will not have a son to reign on his throne. Jeremiah said, Thus says the Lord, if my covenant for day and night stand not, and fixed patterns of heaven and earth I have not established, then I would reject the descendants of Jacob and David my servant, not taking him from his descendants, rulers over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But I will restore their fortunes, and I will have mercy on them. It says in Ezekiel 34 that I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them, and he will feed them himself and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will make a covenant of peace with them and eliminate harmful beasts from the land so they may live securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. And I will make them and the places around my hill a blessing. And I will cause showers to come down in their season, and they will be showers of blessing. Also, the tree of the field will yield its fruit, and the earth will yield its increase, and they will be secure on their land. Then they will know that I am the Lord when I have broken the bars of their yoke and I have delivered them from the hand of the one who enslaved them. And they will no longer be a prey to the nations and the beasts of the earth will not devour them. But they will live securely and no one will make them afraid. I will establish for them a renowned planting place and they will not again be victims of famine in the land. They will not endure the insults of the nation anymore. Then they will know that I, the Lord their God, am with them. And that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the Lord. As for you, my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, your men, and I am your God, declares the Lord your God. Isn't that amazing? So the prophets would come and say, the time of the king, like David, will come, and things are going to be made right. And so the people, though they dwindled, and smaller, smaller numbers of people that actually believed this promise existed, they held tight to it. They held it with all their grip, and they looked for the time when this king would come. Imagine just, you know something's going to sprout from this stump. So what do you do? You just go like this. You're just watching and waiting. People over there go, you know, a watch stump never sprouts. <laughs> and you say, I know, I know, but I believe God. The world around me and the destruction of God's people, it, it's not what he wants. The, the sickness, the disease, the evil winning isn't what he wants. So I'm just going to keep my eye right here waiting for that sprout to pop. You can call me a fool, but I trust God. He said a sprout's going to pop here. I'm going to just keep watching. That's what the prophets came and said. Keep your eyes on this promise. Keep your eyes. The king who is the son of David, who will be the son of God, who will rule forever, he's coming. And they were desperate for that day. They were longing for that day. It says in Micah, one of the last prophets, it says that you, Bethlehem, are only a small village among all the people of Judah. And yet the ruler of Israel will come from you, one whose origins are from the distant past, and he will stand to lead his flock with the Lord's strength in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. Then his people will live there undisturbed, for he will be highly honored around the world, and he will be the source of, pre of, of peace. Micah said, okay, the time's coming soon. I want you to keep your eye not just on any stump, but on the stump of Bethlehem. Let's go to Luke chapter 2. This little city, insignificant city, it wasn't Jerusalem, the capital. It wasn't Bethel, the capital of Israel. It wasn't these great cities, but he said, keep your eye on this little city called Bethlehem because something's coming from this little town, and the people believed that, and the prophets trusted that because the son of David, who would be the son of God, who would be king forever, was coming from there. You know who else was born in Bethlehem? David was born in Bethlehem. So it made sense that his descendant would be born there as well. And Luke chapter 2 brings it back to the story that we're familiar with. Chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. And this was the first census taken while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of who? Which is called what? Because he was of the house and family of who? David. In order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. Joseph and Mary didn't even live in Bethlehem. 
But God orchestrated the world forces together so that they were going to travel back to Bethlehem very inconveniently. Mary's nine months pregnant. Do you want to do anything when you're nine months pregnant, ladies? Have a baby is the only thing on the list. But they have to. They're forced now by law to leave their town to go to a city called Bethlehem. And while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around him, and they were terribly frightened. This is God's son's birth announcement. Angels and glory. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praying God and saying, let's all say it together, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among with whom he is pleased. A choir of angels come and they praise and glorify God because his son is born in Bethlehem, the city of David. And the longing of every heart, the waiting, the cries of, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom, captive Israel, is answered. They waited, they waited, they waited. Generations passed, generations died. David himself, dead and buried. But there were a few people that still held out hope that there was going to be a son from David's line who was going to be the son of God who would rule forever, and they kept their eyes fixed upon that day. They kept their heart focused upon that promise, no matter what their circumstances and the world around them told them. And then finally on that great day, in the city of David, the town of Bethlehem, Jesus was born. The one who we read at the beginning would be great, and it would be given the throne of his father David, and he would rule for how long? Forever. forever. You see, the people waited with expectation for the king. They longed for him. They looked for him, and they believed that when there is trouble coming, that the king would be their hope. And as I said before, there was a desperation in the hearts of the people of God. They knew that they needed their king to come, and they longed for him with such a great longing. They couldn't be satisfied by anything else. And then he came, and great joy broke out in all the land. And can you imagine Mary's heart? What was it like to have to be Jesus' mom? And bro poor brother Joseph, <laughs> right? And, and then being Jesus' siblings later on and things like that, right? And, but this was the moment, this was the day that the king was born. That the king was born. Please go to Revelation chapter 5. So the people that had been waiting for this hope and longing for this day. They looked for the coming of Christ. And they knew that their hope would only be realized when the Messiah came. And so here we stand in this moment of history where he came and he has come. And so the, the birth of Jesus Christ and the, the context of this conversation this morning of whether or not we to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ may seem like, well, yeah, yeah, it happened a long time ago. And that, yes, maybe Israel was hoping and waiting for their king to come, and he did, and that's wonderful, and that's nice, and his name was Jesus. But my hope is that in our hearts this morning, by thinking about the magnitude and the bigness of the fact that God's promise was fulfilled through the birth of his son, is that we would realize that this is something that we to ourselves should long to celebrate and rejoice in. That this isn't just some, well, yeah, 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 Old Testament prophecy was fulfilled. Isn't that nice? 
but that we would desire to celebrate the fact that at Jesus' birth, our hope is realized too. We don't just celebrate the fact that he died and rose again, although our hope is found in that alone. And we don't just long for his coming again, but that we realize that the fact that Jesus' birth happened, that it made any of this other stuff possible. And it's worth celebrating. Jesus is the son of David. He's the son of God. He was born in Bethlehem. He came, he died, he lived, he rose again, he ascended, he's glorified now. He's my Lord and Savior. I love him. He's my brother. He's my king. And I want to celebrate his birthday. Jim Tess's birthday was yesterday. He turned 60. And we, family, went over to the house, and you know what we did? We celebrated his birthday. We celebrated his birthday, and, you know, we celebrate, you know, birthday every year, but he was 60 this year, right? And so that's a big deal, right? That's middle age. <laughs> Can I get an amen from all the middle aged people in the room? <laughs> you know what we did at the party? It was a party, first of all. We celebrated the fact that Jim was born and that he was alive, and we talked about his life, and we played a game about, about his life, and we laughed, and we joked, and you know what? Then we had a toast, and we raised, uh, I raised my glass of seltzer to Jim, and, and Rose shared something, and she talked about how thankful she was to have a husband that was faithful. They've been married 39 years. She's known him for 40 years, right? They had two children, and they went through difficult times and good seasons and bad seasons, and, and she she couldn't help but cry as she talked about it. And that's very unusual for Rose. <laughs> but she talked about her love for him, and she celebrated him. And then you know what happened as soon as she was done? His son, Joe, stood up and said, I want to say something too. And he, he thanked him for being a dad. And then, and then he shared something. And, and, then, and then you know what happened after that? His daughter Jess stood up, and she shared something and rejoiced in him. And, and that makes sense because the, the immediate family was was joyful. You know what? Joyful. You know what? There are other people in the room that weren't his biological children, and they celebrated him too. I was one of them. And I, I thanked him for when my father died, for him stepping in to be a dad for me. Right? And how thankful I am for his example and how he could fix everything. And, <laughs> literally. And you know what we did? We celebrated his birth. And everybody there was rejoicing and glad, and we ate food. And we celebrated. And it was wonderful. Should we not celebrate the fact that Jesus, our King, though many years of waiting, though many seasons when it didn't seem like it was going to happen or come together and there were trials and we thought we might have been pers forsaken, should we not celebrate in that context the fact that Jesus, our King, was born? Absolutely we should. And if there's something standing in our way from letting us rejoice in the fact that Jesus was born, then we need to check what's going on in our hearts. If you don't want to celebrate this time of year, fine. But celebrate it. And join us in celebrating it now. Because the reality of it is, we're not just celebrating that he was born, we are celebrating who he is now. It says in Revelation, there's this great moment at the end of history here, in verse 1, that I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open up the book and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. And I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. This book is, is, is symbolic of the rest of the plan of God. And if it's not opened up, we're stuck in this. We've got a great things that have happened in the past, but if this seal's not opened up, we are stuck in this. That's why John wept. And verse 5, And then one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne 
with the four living creatures and the elders, a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out in all the earth. And he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and you have made them to be a kingdom and priests for our God, and they will reign upon the earth. When Jesus walked into the room and he was the one that could open up the seal, they all rejoiced. There was a party in heaven because the lamb that was slain, who had overcome, is going to be able to finish the job that was started in the beginning. Amen. Let's have, our let's have our worship team come up as we finish this section. Verse 11, And I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them were myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. They are celebrating Jesus. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. What I want to invite us to do at Christmas is to celebrate the fact that the one we have been waiting for has come and that the one we are longing for will come to finish the job. Amen. So if your hearts are heavy at Christmas time, if you're unsure of why we should celebrate, He is why we should celebrate. This is why we should celebrate. We should celebrate because worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. So as we finish our Christmas time and we have these few weeks, these few days left. Let's be mindful of this and rejoice and celebrate and have a party and celebrate Jesus' birthday. Amen. And celebrate and rejoice that Jesus is our Lord, that Jesus is our King. Can we all stand and say, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain.